Okay, perfect. So, uh, good morning to everyone and welcome to, the, to this uh, new lecture about the mathematical treatment of causality. And today we will, we will begin to fight with real data, real numbers, uh, um, and uh, we will see how to deal with uh, um, typical problems of directed graphs and uh, uh, we will go at a slow pace, uh, but not so slow like like the like uh, like for like the first lecture. And uh, we will dig begin to to dig a little bit into into this uh, um, into this uh, method and uh, uh, to 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 do some some calculation. Um, I'm sorry that. Uh, um, uh, last lecture, the first lecture, I was not aware that we were in the webinar um, mode, so people couldn't answer the, the, the question. So uh, it will happen that I will, I will pose some question uh, today and uh, I will uh, wait uh, some time, uh, half a minute, let's say, for people to raise the hand and when someone raised the hand, I will... Uh, um, I will, uh, I will, uh, I will see him, and uh, and uh, uh, so I will activate. I will give him the power to 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 speak, and to if he wants to be seen. But I think speaking is enough, and then he can, he, she, uh, it can answer the the question. So let's begin. Um, as you remember, what we uh, saw. Um, what we saw in the, in the last lecture is that in order to be able to pose causal question to our data, to ask questions, what if, what if uh, I do this? What if I didn't do that? And so on and so forth. I need to express all my uh, knowledge of the data in terms of probability distributions. And these probability distributions are, um, are uh, joint probability distributions, I will reorganize it in terms of a marginal uh, probability that I consider as an input and as a conditional probability that I will consider as the mechanism, as the um, mach machinery that takes the probability of A in, as an input and uh, and uh, um, and uh, that gives me as a result uh, the uh, the t the probability of t given a and this mechanism can be given in two ways. I can give a function of a and of all the parents of t in my graph, of course. Uh, so as a function that hasn't. Uh, to be, of course, a linear function. But if I don't know the function, if I'm absolutely unaware of the kind of function that is um, under the, um, the association between T and A, between temperature and altitude, the joint distribution, the conditional distribution is all I need. Of course, with the function, things may be easier, may, uh, we may test our some of our implications, but uh, if I have uh, a probability distribution, uh, a joint distribution and a conditional distribution, that's all I need in order to do my calculations. So uh, let's try to, to, to recap a little bit what, uh, what we did last, uh, last um, um, in the last lecture, uh, we tried to understand if uh, a variable causes another variable, if altitude, for example, causes temperature or pressure, and so on and so forth. Um, now we try to forecast weather. We try to forecast weather by drawing a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. So. This is a simplified version in which altitude uh, determines or um, influences the temperature and the pressure. 
Of course, temperature air, and pressure are not independent. In fact, they are related by physical law, like the gas law. Uh, the gas law, then pressure times volume is equal uh, and the number of moles, Boltzmann constant and the temperature. And pressure and temperature together uh, gives me uh, influence the probability of rain. So how can I deal with this kind of situation? Here I have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five variables. This means that expressing this in terms of joint variables, I would have to write the probability uh, that I have a, a given altitude, a given temperature, a given pressure, given lows, because it's not only the gas low that acts. Um, so I would like, I, I insert the gas low uh, by the volume or by the env environmental condition of my of my setup of course in the open space there is no volume there will be other things like chemical potential and the rain so a prob joint probability of five different variables this is not quite easy to manage uh, if i if you remember the terminology of dag uh, you will see that in the preceding Graph, there are, um, there are uh, variables that have got no parents, like altitude. I can determine altitude by varying a parameter. I'm uh, on this time scale, of course. Uh, and other that have got parents and that have got descendants, like temperature and pressures, and others that have got only parents, like rain. So how can I deal with this? I can deal with this with the recursive decomposition. So what I, what I see is that the probability of having this joint, the, the joint probability is given by the product of the probability of having the variable xe assuming the value, the variable x assuming the variable xe conditioned on all the parents of uh, this, of the variable. So for the graph that we saw earlier, we have rain, pressure, temperature, altitude, and gas low, but the probability of having a given altitude is a marginal probability. Uh, we, uh, we can't, we have no parents, we can modify altitude. The probability of having a given temperature is conditioned on the altitude at which we are and on the uh, physical uh, imposition of the environmental condition, like given by that will be given by the gas law. So, the physics of the system. In this, at the same time, the pressure, the probability of having a given um, barometric pressure is given by the altitude and by the physical environment, the gas law, and so on and so forth. And then the probability of having the rain in my simplified in my simplified model, is conditioned only on temperature and pressure. So in my model, if I know the temperature and the pressure, I uh, can estimate the probability of rain. So this is, uh, is, mm, makes things considerably easier. Uh, so are we missing gas low? Um, I, I asked. Um, let's let's sorry. Uh, um, let me ask Andrea what he is what he um, um, what he intends precisely. Uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, Okay, Andrea, can you, can you? Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, Marco. Uh, I think that in the formula, maybe, the, the probability of gas law, uh, I'm missing it when we do the decomposition, maybe. Okay, um, if you, um, if we uh, go, um, if we go to, to the graph, you yeah. see that the temperature, depends on the altitude because yep. altitude is the parent of temperature mm -hmm. 
but uh, the environmental condition so um, the the fact that the the fact that temperature and pressure are not independent imagine it, if you are if you if you raise the temperature in a in a um, in a batch of a given volume for example in a imagine a mountain valley okay mm -hmm. if you raise the temperature in this uh, um, if you if you have a valley sorry uh, you have a sort of a um, sort of a basin with a given volume okay so the fact of having a, a basin with a given volume influences both the temperature and the pressure yeah yeah, yeah. I, I get that but i think that in the formula there wasn't the marginal of gas law uh, according to this graph when we do the joint uh, oh of course of course but the, the, well the margin of gas the marginal of gas law is of course the volume uh, you you're right you're right okay. um it is missing so in ter i'm yeah, sorry yeah, that, that's there is, what... there, there is the marginal of the gas law of course uh, yeah. this is my this is my mistake thanks so as a as a as a prize, I will I will shut you down and uh, thank you very much for recording this. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. Um, um, so yes, in this in the formula, you have to insert uh, the um, the uh, the marginal the marginal probability of the environmental condition of the gas law that is having a given volume. So. Um, uh, okay, sorry. Um, so uh, why do we use this uh, recursive decomposition? Of course, it's um, extremely unlikely uh, to have a sufficient number of samples for the tuple of five members. You can imagine how much measures, how much measurements I should have but for the marginal probabilities, the probability of altitude, the probability of having a given volume that here still does not appear, the probability of uh, temperature, condition, and altitude, and uh, environment, probability of pressure, condition, and altitude, and gas law, and so on and so forth, it is, it is easier to, uh, to collect a sufficient number of samples for probabilities conditioned on one or two um, on one or two variables so the first help that comes from recursive decomposition like you probably know is to have a a, a sample that is uh, um, uh, that is more efficiently sampled so uh, with uh, that is less sparse and uh, um, so uh, what is if we want to, to do causal reasoning on this on this um, on uh, a given variable, let's say a variable x, what and to understand the causal effect of x on y? First of all, you draw a directed graph connecting all the variables that we wish to consider, including of course x and y. In this case, for example, the temperature and the pressure, the temperature and the rain or the pressure and the rain. Of course, this is the part where your brain, your knowledge, your, um, your knowledge of the world enters into a model. There's no free lunch in this kind of calculation. It's not like in deep learning, although that we, we will see application of causality in deep learning, uh, you can't um, you can't pour the data in a um, Bayesian in a Bayesian network in a Boltzmann machine uh, in a layered network structure and do supervised or unsupervised uh, learning just by tuning. You have to infer a model, a specific model. You have to know what you are talking about. Then. Uh, you will find a way to, obt to obtain conditional probabilities. Of course, the conditional probabilities are the ingredients of your calculation. So by means of observed data, experimental data or simulation data, or in terms of functions or mixed, there's no, there's no problem. Then 
you have to test if the graph is coherent with the data. One of the good things of this approach of drawing a growth, drawing a causal growth, and, uh, um, and then, uh, and then to, uh, to, uh, to do the calculation is that it can be falsified. Uh, you can draw a graph and then you can test with the data if the graph is uh, um, if coherent or not, or if it has to be rejected. And the fourth point, if it is coherent, if you see that all the independence condition are satisfied, you intervene mathematically on X and estimate the effect on Y by means of product decomposition. And we will see technically how to do it. So uh, just, to, um, just to, to, to underline the use of directed, why we use directed graph. Uh, first, of course, as we were saying, is the ease of visualization. Imagine a system with 10 binary variables, you would need a table with 1,024 entries. Uh, not easy to visualize. Ignorance. We don't need to explicitly write down the equation that relates the parent variable to the, to the child variable. We just write probability of T condition on A and we draw an arrow. That means I know that this influences that by I don't know why. It's like, for example, in the last day, uh, Jose Mourinho, the, man, the former manager of uh, Inter, Tottenham, uh, Liverpool, uh, Manchester, and so on, has been hired by Roma, a football team in Italy. I know for sure that um, Mourinho as a manager will influence the uh, performance of Roma, but I don't know how. But I'm quite sure that I can draw an arrow from Mourinho to as Roma, and then data will save me. And then understanding, as I was saying, we can judge the possibility to evaluate causal effect by inspection of the graphs. That means that we mutually help our understanding of what's going on by drawing, rejecting, accepting different, different graphs. So in order to understand how, how graph, how graph um, work, we have to think of graphs like sort of hydraulic networks in which information flows. And information can flow uh, quite, quite uh, different from uh, usual hydraulic networks. If I open certain kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, nodes of, um, of uh, joining of the pipe, or if I close them, so certain nodes allow for information flow from X to Y when they are open. That means when we do not condition on them, when we do not calculate a conditional probability, we will see an example. Other nodes allow for information to flow when they are closed because they, uh, strati by stratifying, they, um, they, make, uh, they make up a connection when we condition on them. And so conditioning automatically for all the auxiliary variables is never a good idea. If I want to see the effect of X on Y and I have many variables in my mechanism and I decide to stratify on all variables, I can um, organize, um, I can uh, delude myself with a very complicated, very involved version of the Simpson paradox. So we have to understand which variable um, work as confounders, which variable works as colliders, which variables work as just neutral flow pipes. So we will, um, we will uh, classify nodes according to their role. Uh, so in this, in this uh, sorry, in this, uh, um, in this slide, we can see three different kinds of nodes. A node can, can, can represent a chain. X goes to Y, that goes to Z. This is called a chain. 
Mm, it's like uh, from the Markov chain. The value of X depends on the value of Y and depends on the value of Z. Of Z. Uh, um, a thing to, to remember when dealing with chain is that if I know Y, I already, uh, and Y is the only way from X to pass information to Z, then if I know Y, I know Z with, without no need to know something about X. Then there is a fork. A fork is a, when the variable y uh, influences both x and z. And we saw them in uh, it's the so-called common cause effect that, you, that we saw in the last lecture. Uh, the, um, the season, if it's summer or if it's winter, influences both the selling of ice cream and both the, and the, and the probability of having Wood, wood, uh, wood fires. Then the third, and the third, and the third is the most subtle is the collider. A collider, as we will see, can send information if we condition on it. So it is, it is a, um, an object that deserves some care. And then. Uh, this is the formula for deseparation. Deseparation is the concept that will allow us to understand if the graph that we draw is coherent or not coherent with the, the data that we are given. Deseparation is the recipe, is the recipe that we will use to see if data that we are given and um, uh, and um, graph that we draw are actually uh, do actually work is a powerful tool to see if uh, uh, we draw a graph that can work or that can work not. So the definition of this separation is the following. I will read it because uh, uh, of course many of you can't read properly. A path P is blocked by a set of nodes Z Z and the set of which we, uh, we condition, uh, if and only if P contains a chain of nodes, A, B, C, or a fork, A, B, C, such that the middle node B is in Z, so, uh, or P contains a collider, A, B, C, such that the collision node B is not in Z, so we don't condition on Z, and no descendant of B is in Z. We will, uh, this is a definition, of course, and as a definition is rather, is rather not user-friendly, but we will see it in action. And look at what does it mean? Let's take this example. I'm quite terribly sorry that usually uh, examples or case studies in causality deals with things uh, that uh, are unpleasant. And uh, uh, um, I would say it very clearly in Italian, but I have been told to, to, uh, to avoid the trivialities and vulgarities of other kinds of things. So I will only make this gesture. But in this, in, this, um, in this kind of situation, it's often useful to use this sort of unhealthy example. So imagine that you want to understand the effect of smoking on the probability of having a cardiac arrest. Um, of course, uh, uh, smoking is not unrelated to other factors, for example, uh, if I divide the population in population that have an healthy lifestyle or that have an unhealthy lifestyle, uh, of course, uh, there is a common cause that, that is the unhealthy lifestyle, the fact that, that I don't care, that I don't care about my health and my general condition, that makes me uh, prone to smoke and that makes me prone to be overweight. And these two are common uh, ancestors, are common parents of cholesterol, of uh, cholesterol uh, uh, levels in the blood. So in order to assess efficiently the effect of smoking on the cardiac arrest, I have not only to be able to estimate directly 
the effect of smoking on cholesterol and then on cardiac arrest, but they have also to uh, block the spurious correlation that will make some information flow from this common cause. And then, uh, for example, in, in, uh, in the wood fires, in the wood fire example, uh, if, I, if, uh, if I ignore the common cause, I will have as, as a, I will, I could, I could try to stop the sale of ice cream in terms of stopping, um, of, of stopping the, um, the wood fires and the, 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 um, the intervention of the, of the fire squad, but I will get no result. So I have to quantify the effect of smoking on cardiac arrest. I don't only want to see it influences it, but I want to know how much it influences this probability. So uh, what should they do? I already, I, would, uh, I already said, I want to evaluate this effect. And so I have to block the spurious information and want to maintain the direct connection. So I have in this case, what I, uh, what I call a backdoor path that connects my uh, the smoking through cholesterol in, an, uh, in a spurious way. So, uh, I can condition on the backdoor path. We will see. Uh, we will see uh, what does it mean, but mathematically in what is going on after. But our aim is that controlling by weight that is uh, taking the sample, the total sample on the people, and stratifying it. So making a different calculation for people underweight for people of proper weight for people slightly overweight and for obese and severe obese i have to watch the effect of smoking on these five stratified categories and then i have to um, take into proper account the amount of population of population of each stratum then in order to properly uh, to properly um, have the effect of smoking on cardiac arrest, I have first of all to stratify my population in terms of weight and then consider the quantity, the relative quantity of all the uh, relative population. So conditioning, in this case, this is called conditioning on the backdoor path. And conditioning on this uh, in this, on this variable uh, makes, makes me possible to do a causal calculation. But uh, of course, we don't want to exaggerate because imagine that I stratify my sample, not only on the weight, but I stratify on weight, on the amount of cholesterol and on an unhealthy lifestyle, then I would uh, obtain that smoking and cardiac arrest are the separated. So the probability of smoking and of having a cardiac arrest conditioned on cholesterol, weight, and an healthy lifestyle would result as independent. So I would make a horrible mistake. So the question that I pose here is, according to what we've said uh, up to now, if I condition on weight and cholesterol, so not on an healthy lifestyle, but I condition only on weight and cholesterol, what will be the result of my calculation? The smoking and cardiac arrest will result of de-separated or already connected? I will wait for 30 seconds for someone to raise the hand or a chat or a signaling his presence in some way.
Okay, some of you is in Mexico, so is justified if he is sleeping because it's about 2.30 in the morning. But for the Italian people, people residing in Italy or in Europe, Okay, Leonardo is correct. Disseparate, they are disseparated because even the, the single variable cholesterol that is, you see, on a chain between smoking and cardiac arrest is enough. So uh, it is, uh, it would be uh, not, uh, it would be not uh, um, a, um, a smart thing to condition on variable, on all the variable or on some variables, uh, um, thinking that uh, in this way we can improve our understanding of things. In fact, it's actually the opposite. So the collider risk. Let's assume that uh, we, uh, uh, we want to, uh, to understand uh, um, the effect of, of uh, of, of some uh, illness of some of some uh, Ill, illness condition on uh, my general status of health i know that both influenza or chicken pox can cause fever okay so uh, what happen what happens if i condition on fever so if i take all the patients in my uh, in my hospital, and I want to understand uh, which kind of of um, which kind of of uh, of, uh, of illness, which uh, which pathology are they affected, and I condition on a collider. If a condition on a collider, uh, when if I don't adjust for fever, I think I have that influenza and chicken pox are correctly de-separated. I want them to be de-separated because influenza do not cause chicken pox or chicken pox do not cause influenza. They are two different pathology. And in my simplified model, uh, these two, um, these two, uh, uh, these two aspects, these two different pathologies cannot be influenced one another. So if I take all my patients and do a, a list of exams and I do not condition for fever, I do not separate people having fever from people having not fever, then I, uh, I, it, it is all right. But what happens if I condition on fever? If I condition on fever, I have a negative correlation. So it appears that patients having influenza, have people have influenza or chicken pox, but they can't be fine. So I will, uh, uh, all the, pa the patients, um, the patients are, have or influenza or chicken, or chicken pox. So I, uh, I lower the probability of patient to be, uh, to, to be fine. I introduce a spurious, a spurious correlation. If you remember, um, probably it's it's um, it's um, it, this example can be understood better on the um, on the Hollywood actors example. Imagine that I want to understand if beauty and the ability to act, ability to perform as an actor, are related. I. I'm quite convinced that they are not, but I might be um, tempted to, uh, con to, to analyze only Hollywood actors. So what does it happen with Hollywood actors? An Hollywood actor is, can, a, people can, a person can become an Hollywood actor if he's extremely beautiful, Keanu Reeves or became as an, um, an Hollywood actor if he's very good in performing as an actor, Danny DeVito. Or it can become an Hollywood star if he's beautiful and he's very good in acting, Johnny Depp. But so if I condition 
on Hollywood actors, I do not consider the fact that they are Hollywood actors. So they have one or beauty or capability to acting or both. So I will see a negative relation in sense that if you're very beautiful, then your, your ability to perform as an actor is negatively correlated with your appearance and on the contrary side, because I do not consider the vast majority of people playing people that can't act and that are not interested in acting. So I introduce a spurious correlation by conditioning, by controlling a variable that has not to be controlled. A hidden pitfall in this is that conditioning on a descendant of the collider is as wrong as conditioning on the collider. Here I, I use the influenza and chicken pox example, but uh, I think that is easier to understand by going on, on the speaking about Hollywood actors. Imagine in the graph that I, that I pose here, um, substitute uh, uh, Fever with, uh, of course, being a Hollywood actor, Hollywood stars, and substitute acetaminophen, the, um, the, the, the molecule that you produce uh, when, when uh, your temperature rises with money, the amount of money that you get. So, uh, um, if you condition, uh, if you try to understand if there is a relation between beauty and the ability to act conditioned on the money, on the salary that you earn, you will see again a negative correlation because uh, people, if you, if, you, um, if you condition on money, because very rich people probably is very rich, extremely rich, because they are in the Hollywood business. So you reach the same negative correlation that you were given before. You have a negative correlation between being beauty and being and being uh, rich, being, being beauty and being able to act. Uh, so um, this is a counter counterintuitive pitfall and I encourage yourself to find other example that may work better than the one I, uh, that the one I just, uh, I, just, uh, um, I just mentioned. But I'm aware that this may be a, counter, a counterintuitive point. So if there is some uh, problem, is that if there is some question about it, please, uh, write something in the chat and uh, and we will try to um, we will try to say things in a different and probably worse way but uh, um, i will wait for some second in order to understand if all is going well i think that you can manage with this but sometimes it's a little bit is a little bit uh, um, confounding this kind of thing so if there is some doubt but if I don't see nothing, I can go and go. Uh, and let's understand uh, how this separation, how this separation helps me in uh, help me in assessing if my graph is correct. So, for example, let's take let's take this graph. Suppose that I have this graph uh, that uh, I draw in order to understand the causal effect of uh, the causal effect of x on 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 uh, the causal effect on x of x on y. So this separation tells us which variables in our model must be independent, conditional on which other variables. So. If these independence are not met in my data, if I do calculate independence in my data and these independence are not met, the model is wrong and thus to be rejected. 
what do I mean for independence? Of course, uh, the uh, let's say marginal independence is we all know probability of joint probability of X and Y is uh, nothing more that uh, the two marginal probabilities multiplied P X times P Y. The conditional independence X and Y are independent conditioned on Z. If the probability of X condition on Z times the probability of Y condition on Z is equal to the joint probability conditioned on Z. And the most reliable test for uh, testing the independence of these two variables is, of course, testing for the mutual information. Mutual information is an informa information measure that uh, makes mm, that says me uh, the amount of information that variable x gives me on variable y and it works not only in a linear framework but in every framework so you calculate the mutual information for two variables that have to be independent conditioned on some uh, on the set that de separates uh, your uh, nodes in the graph and if the mutual information is not zero or is over the uh, the error range that i did that, that i can uh, estimate due to the uh, due to the knowledge of the informational entropies of the system then i say no my graph is not correct let's let's do an example in this case you see that uh, in this case, you see that uh, W and Z1 have to be independent conditioned on X, okay? Because X de-separates Z1 from W. So, uh, in this case, I test, I calculate the mut from the data, the mutual information of uh, between W and Z1 conditioned on X, and I, uh, and I just uh, watch the result. If the result is different from zero, then my graph is wrong. There is no way that I can deal with it. Of course, uh, you could do it uh, with uh, linear regression analysis, but you have to be sure that between Z, X1, and Xn, and W, only linear relationship hold. So my advice is, uh, since we are data, data analysts and data scientists, and we are uh, perfectly aware of the, um, of the perils, of the pitfalls of linear regression of linear analysis, please take care uh, this in consideration. Linear regression, linear analysis tells us that there is a relation only if the relation is linear. If I have uh, data that are related, I relate X and Y by a points that are on a diagonal, well, that's a linear relation. But if I draw a circle, in the X, Y plane, drawing a circle would give me a linear coefficient of regression of zero and a mutual information coefficient of one. They are not independent, but with linear regression, I would have no hope of discovering it. So please, uh, I, 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 I invite you to uh, be aware when you use linear regression, and since we are in 2021, uh, please give a strong preference to mutual information tests um, that's on, that can be done really in, uh, in a short amount of time. I say this even if for some, some of you will appear trivial because I see I have so usually and in, in uh, inactive research, people using linear regression um, with, uh, with, uh, with ease and, confi and with confidence. It's, it's not a smart, it's not a smart thing to do. So, let's look 
at this, uh, if I, first of all, I will stop a little bit. Is I ask if there is any question uh, up to now, because the question that we 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 are the the thing that we that we saw may uh, may raise some doubt. So, is there any question uh, up to now that you want to to ask or some something that you want to clarify? Oh, there's a wonderful sound of silence that arrived here. I'm really... Oh, Andrea Pugnana, uh, does the mutual information captures independence? Yes, it's in this sense. Uh, um, let's, let's, go, uh, let's, go on, uh, let's go backwards, sorry. Okay, let's take mutual information, the formula of mutual information that you see, uh, that you see here. Uh, if uh, if the um, uh, the two variables x and y conditioned on z uh, are um, independent, then the numerator, the probability of x uh, joint y time uh, condition on z is equal. You see, is equivalent to the product of the two probabilities. So if numerator and denominator, the, the up and the down of the of the of the of the, the of the ratio is uh, they are equal uh, they are equal the um, the result is uh, the result is uh, one, so the logarithm of one is zero. And so uh, you see that, uh, um, that you capture independence in this way. I, then there is a question from Leonardo. If, please, Leonardo, I, uh, you can speak. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, you mentioned that we have to, let's say, specify the, the DAG a priori, right? Yeah. in order to be able to do these tests. And I was wondering if this has to be done globally or can also be done locally. So let's say that I have uh, a lot of variables, but maybe it's, a, you know, let's say, 100 variables, right? Do I need yeah. to specify the whole graph in order to, do, to be able to do any tests? Or can I also apply them, let's say, to a subgraph? And it's a, it is a very good question. It is a very good question. Uh, you can, you can, uh, you can apply it even on a subgraph, but under some given condition that we will see, uh, that we will see in the, in the following. Um, okay. But uh, the question is, is, uh, is, uh, is really a, a, a good question. In the beginning, uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, um, it's not recommended to. It's better to draw a graph, and it's better to draw uh, the simplest graph possible. And then there are rules that allow you to build, let's say, to uh, separate a variable to and to to put and to put other uh, other variables, uh, mediators or intermediators. And then you make your your um, your graph grow, but uh, uh, the best thing to do is to start with the simplest, the trivial, the more trivial graph that I can imagine, and in that way I can be sure that I can grow a graph uh, on and and that I can rely on the preceding tests. That I, uh, if I do a test on a simple graph, then I can grow a, an involved graph, and I can rely on the tests made on the, on the simple graph. But the answer, the, the question is good and simple. The answer is quite complicated. We will see. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. So uh, now uh, we will. Um, uh, we are no, we are now ready to uh, understand how we can intervene on on a graph. If you remember, uh, we um, we said 
that do calculation is based on intervention, is based on uh, blocking the parent, the parents arriving in a, in a given variable and imposing to that variable our value. A sort of, uh, of a mathematical equivalent of, of an experiment. So let's try to take the example that we did, that we did in the first lecture. Uh, I had a drug, if you remember, that was um, good for um, uh, good for female, good for male, but um, but harmful for the global patient. So how do I intervene on a graph? First of all, I draw the graph. And if you remember, we, uh, we decided quite arbitrarily, I decided, and if, you're not, if you do not agree, I would be very curious to, to, to hear your, your motivation, that the gender, Z, uh, influences both the drug intake and the recovery in terms of the fact that Females are more prone and follow more the instruction of the physician, so they take the drug more frequently when uh, um, they follow more the prescription of the physician. And the estrogens, the production of estrogens, influences the recovery after a stroke. And so, how I intervene on a graph? I just remove all the parents that are going into my control variable, the variable that I want to uh, understand, sorry, the, the control variable, the variable of which I want to understand the effect. So in this case, X, the drug. And I calculate the probability, the joint probability, not on the original model. You see here on the left, the probability of X being X, Y being Y, Z being Z, but the, prob the joint probability on the modified models. So the joint probability on this new graph in which the parent from all the variables, in this case only Z, to pointing into my causal or supposedly causal variable are uh, pointing, these all are removed. So doing this, I am able to see this, that, uh, that the in my modified model, uh, the probability of um, Y is exactly the same. I do not touch any of the two mechanism uh, leading from X to Y and from Z to Y. So the joint, the conditional probability is the same. I'm now looking on conditional probability because if you remember, in a graph, I can always express my uh, joint probability in terms of conditional probabilities. And uh, having Z no parents, the probability in the modified graph of Z is, of course, always the same. So using the first two relationship that, uh, that we have here, uh, on the in uh, on the on the high part, I can. Sorry, I can. Uh, I can do my calculation using them, because I uh, I calculate the probability of y taking the value the value uh, y uh, minus uh, on the condition that I do x taking the value that I want. That is, I calculate the probability of y being y on my condition on the modified graph, on the graph in which I uh, uh, extracted, I, 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 I ripped off the parent and, and uh, I made uh, arrive my control mechanism. So uh, I, I, I write it in terms of my Bayesian uh, product rule. And so I, I, I say, I take the probability of Y being Y and the probability of Z being Z. And I, um, and these are the conditional probabilities. And then I marginalize, I sum over 
all the variables that are not x, neither y. Of course, I want to see the effect of x on y. I marginalize, I condition on all the other variables that are involved in the product, the composition of the uh, given by my uh, conditional independence. And then I see that the probability on, on, the, on, the, on the modified graph, uh, on the modified graph that having the value of Z uh, conditioned on, uh, on X, uh, it's just the, um, it's just the probability of Z being Z because there is not in the parent graph, not even, uh, sorry, quite sorry. Uh, here I, I say something, I say something wrong. Uh, the uh, formula that you see as the uh, fourth formula from the, um, uh, from the upper side, so the first with the summation does not come from that from knowledge of the graph, but comes only from laws of ordinary probability. If I want to know uh, the, pro the conditional probability, the conditional probability of uh, y uh, conditioned on x, I can always, I can always express it uh, as the probability of y conditioned on x and z times the probability of uh, of um, of z condition on x on the on the modified graph and on the modified graph as well as on the original graph the um, the uh, probability of z being z is of course independent of x so we obtained our formula, the adjustment formula. I can calculate, I can calculate the um, probability of y being y, forcing x to be x, just by uh, conditional probabilities only. Uh, if you see this, the conditional probabilities are the conditional probability on the on the uh, on the modified graphs and uh, uh, but these probabilities as we saw on the modified graphs are exactly equivalent to the probabilities on the original graph so we can use the original probability that we have that we are given the original conditional probability that we are given from the data in order to in order to calculate in order to calculate the adjustment formula we did it uh, now this thing has to uh, we have to note two things about this the first thing is that uh, this formula can be estimated directly from the data. And in this thing, and so we have, a, uh, we have no need for experiment. And this, is how, this was our aim. And then uh, we can do, we can use this formula in order, uh, in order to, uh, to calculate the actual effect of using the drug, because what will I do? What will I do is just I will take the uh, I will take the um, probability of recovering y equal, equal to one. If I take the drug do x equal one minus the probability of recovering y equal one. If I do not take the drug, I do I do the calculation first forcing all the people to take the drug and then forcing all the people not to take the drug. As we saw, the, the bias in the, in the experiment was the fact that women were more prone to follow the advice of the physician and more prone to, uh, to take the, the medicine. So we can rule out this tendency and we can calculate the due effect 
uh, we can calculate the, the due probability. And if you take the, the, the example that we did in the, in the you have to uh, calculate the probability of recovering if uh, I take the drug is the probability that I recover if I take the drug and I am a woman times the probability of being a, a woman, Z equal one, plus the probability of taking of recovering and if I take the drug and I am a man times the probability that I am a man. And I compare that this calculation with do x equal one to the same calculation with x equal zero. And I see that in this case, in the first case, the probability of recovering is 0 0.832. And in the second is 0 0.782. The difference is a conspicuous 5%. So the effect of the drug is there is and is a positive effect. The drug helps in recovering. So by this, uh, by this uh, calculation, I can calculate the average causal effect uh, for, for, uh, uh, for all the relatives, AC. The average causal effect is, what is the effect of my variable of taking the drug on average, on all, uh, if I take all the, um, the participants? Uh, taking just the uh, taking just the experimental numbers, as we saw, would have given us a, a conditional probability, the probability of recovering if I take the drug, minus the probability of recovering if I didn't take the drug, and this was negative. The do probability is not the conditional probability. And in fact, they can have two opposite signs, not only two different quantities, but two opposite signs. So in this, um, in this part, we began to, to, to see something uh, that uh, pertains to reality. And uh, uh, now then I will uh, stop for five, six minutes, uh, time for a coffee and time to organize some questions if there is any, and then we will see in, uh, in five minutes, and we will see in five minutes, and we will, uh, um, and we will again uh, go on uh, dealing with uh, uh, causality on, on, uh, on transparent graphs, on this kind of graphs that we are uh, looking looking at now. So see you in five minutes. And uh, please, if there is any question, mm, if you want, you can use this time to organize them and then to ask me. See you. Hello to everyone. Uh, I hope that everyone can can hear me. And uh, uh, just to, to to begin answering, I uh, answer to to Andrea that asks uh, uh, that um, in the book of why uh, 
uh, Pearl asked that um, despite, said this, despite the simplicity of DAG, uh, they were not much uh, used in context outside statistical ones, despite their simplicity. Um, well, and, and he asked me if the, uh, this trend is changing. And my answer is no at the moment. I hope that uh, uh, I hope that you will be that the one that change it. Why? Uh, because these rules are powerful, but first of all, they are recent. Uh, the, um, the, 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 the the calculus is uh, began to be complete in 2010. Uh, so 10 years, 11 years ago. And second, um, it is not, uh, uh, despite what uh, Pearl says, it is not easy to understand, mostly because books, technical books and articles written by Pearl are not easy to understand uh, outside the field of mathematics and data science, and sometimes even in the field of mathematics of data science. This is something that actually happened many times in science when Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, began to speak about entropy and about uh, statistical mechanics. He was writing in a uh, very involved and very complicated and artistic fashion, and nobody understood him. So I think that now there is the need for people understanding, practicing and understanding and speaking uh, and, uh, and try to popularize this method because in, in, this, in this field, I, it would be interesting to, to um, uh, do some meta-analysis and there's much, much room for meta-analysis if uh, some of, someone of you wants to do active research in this field. Uh, there is much, much room, I think, for meta-analysis on uh, already um, uh, things already uh, done and experiments already done. But at the moment, I hope it, this, of course, I hope this can change, but at the moment there is not a trend. Uh, and Andrea asks, concerning the mutual information testing, we can also use it to direct the relationship between two variables, so just to detect whether the two variables are independent. The answer is no, mutual information is a symmetric quantity. We will see other measures that are that can be used to direct uh, to, to to direct information and they are called, and this is called the transfer entropy. And transfer entropy is a directed measure. Uh, and we will see it in the, uh, in, the, in, the fifth, in the fifth lesson, but the mutual information no, cannot be used to, uh, to, uh, to, direct, uh, to direct an arrow. It just can be used. If you want to direct an arrow up to now, you have to use functional relations or you can use, and this is my advice, you can use transfer entropy. And this is what we will, and this is what we will do. So let's try to, uh, to go on further. And, uh, and uh, let's restart with the wonderful, Presentation. Okay. And just let me arrive. Okay. Perfect. Uh, we saw um, already how to intervene on a single variable. Uh, I may be tempted to ask myself if it is possible to do multiple interventions. So uh, I can uh, intervene on a patient by modifying uh, the drug that he takes and the diet that he, uh, the, 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 the amount, the caloric intake amount, of course I can, and I can do it even on a graph. If you recall the formula, uh, the formula of uh, um, conditional independence, the, the, uh, 
the, mm, the, 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 the formula is actually quite simple because you can always, um, you can do a multiple intervention. So you can of, even, even here, of course, uh, I'm sorry, there is a mistake. I will correct it immediately. But um, okay. Let's let's say let's say uh, B in order to be clear. Uh, what? I can uh, state the effect of, of, uh, of doing B, that is on uh, intervening on a set, on a set of, of, uh, of uh, variables, just saying that uh, the, the probability, the joint probability of uh, the other variables forcing my set is just the product of the uh, probability of all the variables conditioned on their parents for all the e the uh, for all the e that are not in b in fact it's like uh, you can imagine it just by intervening er erasing some arrows so here if i want to intervene if i want to uh, to intervene on this graph that you see and I want to calculate joint probability of Z1, Z2, W, Y by intervening on X and on Z3, what I have to do? What I have to do? I have just to erase the arrows of the, um, of the, um, the arrows that are pointing into the variables that belong to my set, to the set B. So in this case, for example, what I want to do is to erase the arrows that are going into X because I want to condition on X. And I want to erase all the arrows that are going into Z3. So I erase all the arrows going into Z3. And I force them to assume the variable that I want. So what I obtain, you see that the, um, the conditional probability, the joint probability that I obtain forcing x to be x and z3 to take my values, is just the probability of Z1, that is now uh, absolutely disjoint from everything, plus the probability of Z2, uh, times the probability of Z2, times the probability of um, W conditioned on X, his only parent, plus the probability of Y conditioned on W, Z3, and Z2, his parents. Then, if I want to know the causal effect of uh, the total causal effect of, uh, of X and Z3 just on Y, what I do is that I marginalize on these variables. This means simply that I sum for W, Z3, Z1, uh, sorry, Z3, no, because is the one I'm, I'm conditioning, so W, Z1, Z2. So by marginalizing on this, I obtain what I was looking for. 
I obtain do the, the, the effect of the doing B on the variable that I want. But I can always write a, a joint probability in these terms. Uh, okay. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a formula that can always be used when you know the graph, you know all the uh, connections between all the variables in the graph, and the graph contains no cycles. You can always apply the multiple intervention rule, that is that the, uh, the product, the joint, the, 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 the joint probability conditioned on do something is just the product of the variables conditioned on their parents for all the variables that are not, that are not in the, uh, in the controlled set, in, the, in the, the set that is into the brackets of B. Now let's try to understand uh, in uh, real world, uh, in real world, uh, what can be the power of these kind of calculations. And we will use, of course, an example, uh, and we will use an example quite, uh, uh, quite height on the, on the site of culture. How to evaluate a goalkeeper. Here again, um, I, I apologize for this, for this slide being in Italian, but I hope that um, that thing can be understood. Uh, but I will modify it in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment, if you allow me. Okay. Here we've got the team without ball, the team that defends. Here we've got the team with the ball. Of course, in, in soccer is the team with the ball that leads uh, and decides what happens unless you are playing against Italy. In that case, you should reconcile this. There is the goalkeeper. There is the situation. The striker the person that, uh, that makes the shot and the outcome. Okay, let's, let's start again with the, uh, with the presentation. How uh, I draw this causal model about how to evaluate, uh, um, uh, to evaluate a goalkeeper. And uh, uh, let's see if we all agree on this. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the two teams facing the team without ball, the defensive team and the team with the ball, uh, do interact and we arrive at a situation that depends both on the quality of the defense of the team and on the quality of the uh, offending team. So we arrive at a situation in which the striker decides to strike, to, to shot and to... to, to and to let, let the ball uh, go towards the, uh, towards the door, unless the striker is uh, Simone Verdi of Torino. In that case, the, the ball will never, uh, will never go towards the door. It will go in the, let's say, roughly right, right direction. Um, so the outcome depends on three factors. The goalkeeper, the situation and the striker. The goalkeeper, of course, a better goalkeeper will save more attempts. A situation, actually a shot uh, inside the little area made from two meters away from the, from the, from the goal is different from a, a, a shot made 30 meters away from the goal. And of course, the striker. Uh, a, um, a shot made uh, um, 30 meters away from the goal is usually not dangerous. But if the striker is, the striker is Rajan Angolan of Cagliari, former Inter and Roma, uh, this assumption is not true. 
So the outcome depends on this thing. And we may face, uh, um, we may um, evaluate and compare the rough calculation uh, and, the, uh, and the causal calculation. Let's look at the rough calculation. A very naive calculation is the number of goal uh, taken, that is of attempts not saved, divided by the number of shots that one, that one um, keeper faces. And uh, uh, this is a classification uh, made on the, on, the last, uh, on the last three seasons of, uh, of Serie A, last three or four seasons, in which we see, um, in which we see that uh, the best, uh, best goalkeeper is uh, Alison Becker of Roma, now in Manchester United, I think, then uh, Gianluigi Buffon, that which uh, Shenzi. I'm sorry if my Polish is not uh, is not fluent. Uh, Samir Andanovic, uh, Juan Musso, Gianluigi Donnarumma, and so on and so forth. There is there are some surprising aspects. Uh, first, uh, a very good goalkeeper, at least for the um, last four seasons on the data set, on the data set that that I've taken is. Uh, um, considered by many to be Salvatore Sirigu of Torino FC, that here in this classification is, is, quite, is quite low. While uh, Gianluigi Buffon, despite having been the best goalkeeper uh, uh, in the world, is now sampled at an age between 36 and 40, so in the descending parabola. And the, um, the performance of Gianluigi Buffon in the last years have not been, uh, let's say, wonderful. So these two aspects are not quite, uh, quite convincing. And I ask myself, uh, how can I fix it? I can fix it by causal calculation. First of all, Let's understand what I do miss in this kind of calculation. Let's compare the, um, uh, the, the, the danger faced by these two goalkeepers. Here is Buffon uh, playing in the other team of Torino. Uh, I'm sorry, but I refuse precisely to say the name of the team. And from the other part, you have Gabriel, uh, goalkeeper of Lecce. In these graphs, uh, in uh, Ashissa, on the horizontal, you have the expected goal. That is the danger, uh, the estimated danger of the shot that has been directed towards the goal. And in the, uh, on the vertical axis, you've got the number of shots that have been faced by that goalkeeper. And you see that Buffon playing in Juventus, ah, sorry, I swear I didn't, I didn't use that word, um, face a situation that is much less harmful than the one of Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, Takes a, uh, faces a bunch of shots between 0.2 and 0.3, having a probability 20-30% to be, to be scored. And uh, while uh, in this zone, Buffon practically do not face any or, or quite a few. So what happens? Buffon plays in a team which has a better defense. So face situations that are less potentially harmful. And if we do the causal calculation, let's try to do the causal calculation and let's illustrate the causal calculation. What I have to do, I have to, I have to uh, take my conditional independence rules and then, uh, Calculate the probability. I have to uh, to consider to to do a do calculation. I want to force the goalkeeper to be that one. So 
I, uh, I just, uh, I just erase the arrow going from here, from the team with the ball to the goalkeeper. Actually, what I do is that I simulate a parallel championship in, championship in which every goalkeeper plays in every team. So you put Buffon into the goal of Torino, Verona, Inter, Milan, Lecce, uh, Ancona. No, Ancona was, did not play in Serie A, but Crotone, Benevento, and, all, and so on and so forth. Ancona played in Serie A once in 1992-1993, as far as I remember. And, um, and then you watch the performance of this goalkeeper into this virtual championship in which he had to face situation much more or much less harmful than the one he is accustomed to, uh, sometimes playing uh, against his own teammates. And let's see what happens. And by this Causal classification. Okay, Alison Becker is still the best, uh, the best goalkeeper. And if you go and you want to, uh, you want to have a, um, let's see, objective idea of the evaluation of goalkeepers. You can go to transfer market and watch the value, uh, the value in millions of euro of each of each keeper. So we have Alison Becker as the um, as the best goalkeeper by far, and actually Alice, Alison Becker is evaluated if I don't fail something like seventy millions euro by his team. At the second place is Juan Musso of Udinese. That is one of the leading uh, goalkeepers nowadays in in Serie A, uh, who is followed by many top ranked teams and is uh, evaluated between 25 and 30 millions euro. At the third place, there is, uh, is Uishe Shenzi, another very good goalkeeper. But the interesting thing is this. Look at Buffon, is the third from the end. This, these two players, Shenzi and Buffon, play in the same team. And just by inserting the fact that they play in the same team and just by inserting the kind of situations that they face, that they face day by day, match, match by match, match by match, the separation clearly appears. And it clearly appears that there is a difference up to now between Richard Shenzi and Gianluigi Buffon. Shenzi is 11 years younger. And this makes the difference. Shenzi is still a top goalkeeper. Buffon, that helped us Italian in, in winning a, a World Cup, and we, and we love him for this, is no more. And uh, we see, for example, Salvatore Sirigu, a very good goalkeeper, going very high in the range. We see Gianluigi Donnarumma in the middle range, but this is because um, the, um, the sample in on last four years hit a period of one year, uh, 200, uh, uh, 2018, 2018, 2019, in which actually um, performance by Donnarumma were not good at all. Uh, so we uh, were able to estimate the performance of goalkeepers just by uh, just by um, simulating this sort of virtual scenario and we were able to do it thanks to the graph to the um, to the underlying graphs now uh, just before concluding i uh, do a question i have a question for you and this question uh, goes to this I told you that I was able that I was able to uh, to calculate this uh, uh, to calculate this uh, um, causal uh, causal uh, um, uh, effect uh, by doing a complete um, a complete mediation a complete controlling of all this situation team without ball situation team with ball striker and outcome. 
Now, the question that I would like to pose you is, am I doing uh, uh, things that I must do or could I have done something simpler? Is that in your intuition, or as far as I saw that someone is, is uh, already uh, a little bit expert in this kind of calculation, is that something for you that I could have done in order to um, make this calculation without considering, uh, without considering all the variables that I consider, but just uh, doing something simpler? If you want to, you can, uh, if you have some hypothesis, you can uh, raise your hand or, or, uh, or write and uh, we will answer. Leonardo, Leonardo, I think, okay, Leonardo, I will, I, I will allow you to, again, to, okay. Please, Leonardo. Yeah. I was wondering, maybe in this case from the graph, we could only condition on situation and strike. Exactly, exactly. Only conditioning on situation and striker, sorry, you said. Yeah. Well, you could have done this, but ah. you could have done even better. You can condition only on situation because let's look at it. Uh, if you look, I, I don't know if when I move this, this if you if you see the you, you see only the, the yeah. slides. Okay. Can we see the mouse. Okay. Consider this uh, situations situation blocks all the backdoor paths that go from goalkeeper to outcome because from goalkeeper to going in order to go from goalkeeper to outcome there are two pathways there are some pathways sorry. Goalkeeper, outcome. This is the direct path. Then there is a backdoor path. Team without ball, situation, outcome. Then there is another backdoor path that is team without ball, situation, team with ball, striker, outcome. But if I condition for situation, I block both, out, uh, both backdoor paths. I block both the path goalkeeper, team with ball, situation, outcome, and the goalkeeper, team with ball, situation, team without ball, situation, team with ball, striker, outcome, because situation blocks both. I must pass from, um, I must pass from, situation in both backdoor paths. So if I condition only on situation, theoretically, theoretically, I have the same result. I, why I say theoretically? Because when I deal with num numerical, numerical uh, evaluation and with probability, well, usually, uh, usually, the more is the best. And here, uh, if I, I am able to correctly evaluate on which variables I have to conditions and on to condition and on which I have not, uh, the more I put, the best I do as far as I take the right one. But this criterion that is called the backdoor criterion is the criterion uh, that can help us. If I can, if there exists, and this is the backdoor criterion, and we will speak more extensively in the next lecture, but if you have given an order pair of variables in a direct specific graph, and uh, you have a set of variables so that uh, no node in this set is a descendant of X of the variable on which you are doing the do, and Z, the, uh, the set of variables, blocks every path 
between x and y that contains an arrow into x. So a backdoor path is a path that contains an arrow, an arrow into my variable, then you can condition only on it. So uh, in this in this case, it was uh, I could have done something. Um, I could have done something um, uh, something simpler just by conditioning on situation. Actually, uh, I can I can um, say you that conditioning on situation and striker gives uh, a better numerical result, but only conditioning on situation gives uh, uh, almost the correct rank of the goalkeepers. So numbers change slightly by inserting the, the by inserting the, the, the striker, but just inserting the situation gives the first 10 goalkeepers and the last 10 goalkeepers in the correct rank. And this is, uh, uh, and you saw another thing that you saw, if you, um, why? We look for uh, why we look for uh, uh, numerical accuracy. The reason is really trivial. You see that in the point twenty seven performance, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight goalkeeper. So. Uh, Sirigu and Donnarumma or Silvestri and Cragno are all uh, top level goalkeepers, but some of them is more top than the others. We are playing in Serie A and these guys are not there by chance. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so they, uh, we are looking to distinguish between people that has already, already got an outstanding performance. So uh, my advice is always to look in this situation, in situation in which we are on a, on a top level, to look for the better possible numerical performance between, because it can help us uh, quite a lot. But, uh, um, uh, but the, uh, the huge difference that there is between Shenzi and uh, Buffon, for example, or, or Sirigu and Buffon that was quite, was what not possible to see with just the uh, uh, conditional probability emerges clearly. Uh, like, for example, from Mattia Perin that hasn't got very good performance at all and was a, a good player in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the conditional, but not very good in the, in the, in the, in the, in the causal can be, can be seen clearly. So thanks for this, uh, uh, for the for uh, for answering. Uh, and as a prize, as as before, I will exclude you from conversation. Thanks. So, uh, what's next? Um, we have seen that uh, uh, we can do wonderful calculations if we know all the um, all the variables and all the directed edges and we know oh, uh, we can trace all the directed edges between variables but but there is a but and it concerns the possible presence of b directed edges in the first case, or variables that we know, that we know that are present, but that we cannot estimate in any way. For example, go, uh, let's go um, on, the, on the football team, uh, on the football match, uh, on the football match uh, um, analysis. Uh, there is something that I can't consider, and these tactics, the specific instructions that the coach said to the players, the role that the coach says to players. 
Or for example, consider, consider health issues. In every health issue, I have, uh, or I can suspect, a genetic, a genetic, uh, a genetic common cause uh, uh, that can both address the uh, probability of, of, uh, of, a, of a person to be a, uh, a female, and this genetically, I, 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 I swear you can believe me, and the, uh, can predispose you genetically to some kind of illness or to some kind of recoveries or to dependencies or, uh, or to other aspects. In, in other words, there may be in the, in the real world two kinds of problems. The first is be directed edges. When I analyze the performance of football team, I cannot say that uh, the uh, midfielder influences the striker, but the striker does not influence the midfielder. The behavior of one influences the, the, the second, the, the, the behavior of the second influences the one. If the, the striker goes, try to, to, to free himself and tries to receive a pass, he is influencing the midfielder. So the double arrow, the double, the uh, be directed edge is something I can't ignore. On the other side, there are the unknown variables. I know for sure that uh, uh, genetic can influence uh, health problems, but I can't often in vast majority of case look for the gene that causes that because I'm not even, uh, I don't, do not even know where to, to try to, to find that gene or I can't measure at all a variable even if I know that is important. And we will see that even in this case, we can, we can afford, we can um, do, we can do uh, causal calculations according to some conditions that are actually very, very um, favorable. We can do a causal calculation in almost, in almost all kind of situation. Uh, and uh, it's it, and we can uh, only in one case we can't we will see but even in that case we can um, we can find an escape way we can find a a, a way to deal to deal with this by just drawing a new uh, a new model first second of all we we will we can do it with an algorithm we can insert a graph, the graph with directed edges and be directed edges into an algorithm and ask if I can measure the causal effect of X on Y. And the algorithm will say us, will give us, will spit off a product of, um, of conditional probabilities or a false, you can't. Uh, retry, draw a new model. This is not good. But we are given, it, it can be uh, cast into an algorithm, the procedure that we have to follow. So uh, I hope that um, this, this lecture has been uh, interesting. And uh, if there are no uh, questions, we, uh, we will see us on, uh, on next Tuesday. Um, and if, of course, there are questions uh, now in this in this moment, I'm I'm ready to to answer. If some of you want, if if not still uh, uh, gasping from the amount of equation and difficult concepts and lack of coffee that we have been exposed to. So if there are no questions, I thank you all again for uh, your participation. We will see uh, in, uh, next Tuesday and we will uh, afford the, the mysteries of graphs with B-directed edges or unmeasurable, unmeasurable variables. And let's try how to, how to speak to them.
Thank you very much for your attention and see you on the next Tuesday. Thank you, Marco.